Good evening, everybody. My name is Mrs. Stanley, and I teach business at Dulwich College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Thank you for tuning in to this Thinking About talk, the latest in this new series from Dulwich College and SSLP. We're pleased that so many have joined us from, from schools here in London, across the UK, and also internationally. Each week during the summer term, we are inviting different speakers to discuss what they are thinking about in their area of specialism and interest. A wide range of topics and issues we covered, merging arts, science, humanities, and languages. Tonight we meet Dr. Emma Springate, a laser physicist working at the UK's National Laboratories in Oxford. Dr. Springate studied physics at Oxford, followed by a PhD at Imperial College. She then did postdoctoral research in Amsterdam and at Imperial before moving to the Central Laser Facility at the Rutherford Appleton Lab in Oxfordshire. She managed a project to build the Artemis Laser Lab for ultrafast science and has led the Artemis group since then. She will talk about research in her lab, which uses ultra short pulses of laser light as strobes to freeze frame ultrafast processes, such as molecules breaking down chemical reactions and then sequence them into high speed movies. The powerful lasers required to do this use the 2018 Nobel Prize winning technique of chirped pulse amplification. Researchers from many UK and European universities come to use these lasers for experiments in physics, chemistry and biology. The format for this evening will include Dr. Spriggate's talk and then Dulwich College student Henry Bouchard will host the Q&A. You are welcome to send your questions in via the Q&A function at any point during the talk. I will now hand over to Dr. Spriggate. Thank you very much for being here with us this evening and I hope you enjoy giving this talk as much as we will enjoy listening to you. Hi, so good afternoon everybody. I'm Emma Springate from the Central Laser Facility in Oxfordshire. So thank you, Jenny, for the lovely intro. I will just share my screen with you. Uh, hold on. Okay, so, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the laser facility Artemis that I run. So Artemis is a, a facility for ultra-fast XUV science. So we are a big laser laboratory then we're open for access to users from around the UK and Europe who come to do experiments with us. And our users are university research groups, typically a PhD student and a professor will turn up uh, maybe in a group of four to do an experiment with us. So uh, we're based at the UK's National Laboratories in uh, Harwell campus, which is about an hour to the west of London. Um, hold on, I'll try and get my pointer out. Yeah. So we're, we're out an hour to the west of London, just between Oxford and Reading. And we're on a really big campus that's uh, all about science, really. So the campus holds some of the, uh, the largest infrastructure for science in the UK. So this enormous aluminium donut here is the diamond synchrotron uh, that makes x-rays. So it looks at the structures of materials and uh, crystalline samples. And currently people are doing a lot of research there on the structure of the coronavirus. Uh, the other really big thing on site is that a slightly unfortunately named ISIS neutron source that produces uh, beams of neutrons scattering off materials to look at their, func their functions. Uh, and in the uh, big building here, we have some of the largest, uh, largest laser systems in the world that are kind of the size of football fields. Uh, there's a data center here for CERN and there's a national satellite test facility here. And my lab, Artemis for ultra fast XUV science is just tucked away here. We're quite small in comparison to everything else on campus. So we're part of the uh, Science and Technologies Facilities Council, which is the government's uh, uh, organisation that, that runs science in the UK. So Science and Technology Facilities Council is responsible for the UK's large scale research infrastructure. So the synchrotrons, neutrons and lasers that I showed you on the map, but also uh, supercomputers, uh, telescopes, which are in places like Chile and La Palma with good clear atmospheres so they can see the sky better. Uh, we also do accelerator science, so designing how to build uh, synchrotrons like diamond. Uh, we do uh, particle physics, we have loads of people working out at CERN, uh, space physics, making instrumentation for things like the James Webb Space Telescope, and also nuclear physics. So loads of really spectacular science going on on campus. 
uh, and in the organisation, which makes it a really fantastic place to work. So my facility, we do ultrafast science in the extreme ultraviolet, and I'm going to take you through both what I mean by ultrafast science and the extreme ultraviolet. So uh, this is my student Alfred in the lab, and we do experiments that span uh, condensed matter physics, uh, biological imaging. These are images that we've taken of mouse neurons using a new kind of uh, microscope that doesn't have any lenses. Uh, and we also do chemistry experiments as well, mostly gas phase rather than the solution phase stuff here. So I'm going to talk you through what we do and why we do it and then show you an example of a condensed matter physics experiment. So this is my lab, uh, Artemis. So uh, we are uh, two fairly big rooms of, of labs. So we have uh, two laser systems. This one's brand new here and this one uh, I've worked with for the last 10 years or so. And we have three beam lines. So the beam lines are like this piece of equipment here. So they're a series of vacuum chambers connected together that light can travel down, down to the end stations, like this one here, which kind of are portable vacuum chambers with detectors for doing different kinds of experiments. So we have one for gases here, one for solids, and one just out of shot for imaging experiments. So we're a team of eight people and we do eight to ten different experiments per year with different user groups coming in from around the country. So I really enjoy it because I work with a, a very, very nice bunch of people and we get to do a huge variety of science and meet a lot of different people as well. So what we do, we do ultrafast photoelectron spectroscopy with extreme ultraviolet pulses. So by that, I mean that we make very, very short laser pulses in the extreme ultraviolet region of the spectrum. I'll show you where that is next. And then we use Einstein's photoelectric effect and look at the energies of the electrons that we eject from our sample. And then we use these uh, uh, laser pulses and electrons and we take snapshots of ultrafast processes on femtosecond timescales, where a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds, so a thousandth of a millionth of a millionth of a second. And the kind of applications that we do, so we look at uh, new materials for super fast electronics. Uh, so materials like graphene and materials that uh, researchers have to grow basically atom by atom because they're so difficult and delicate to grow. Um, we do search that's relevant to solar cells, looking at how electrons move around in solar cells and how to make them more efficient. Uh, we look at catalysis, uh, particularly how uh, catalysts and ca catalytic processes can be started by light. And we also look at chemical reactions started by light, such as DNA damage from sunburn uh, and the mechanisms for, for vision in, in the eye, which are all chemical, big chemical reactions in big molecules that, uh, that are started as the light falls on the molecule. So the region of the spectrum that we work in is the extreme ultraviolet, which is kind of the bit of the spectrum that nobody ever mentions. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we're used to the visible region here. And you know that if you go to longer wavelengths, you get to the infrared. And slightly shorter wavelengths, you get to the ultraviolet. And really short wavelengths is the X-ray. Well, this part in the middle here is where we do most of our experiments. And it's called the XUV, the extreme ultraviolet. And it's not very well known or commonly used uh, because uh, the XUV only travels in vacuum. If you try and pass it through air, it's just completely absorbed in less than a millimetre of air. And uh, it ionises pretty much every material because it's a, a, a short wavelength, a high photon energy. So it ionises everything through the photoelectric effect. And it's good because it uh, has a really high frequency, which means you can make very, very short pulses. So the shortest pulse of light that you can make is one optical cycle. So that's one up and down of the electric field. And if you're at high frequencies, the up and down is a lot shorter than it is at long frequencies. So we can make short pulses uh, down to attoseconds. So 10 to the minus 18 seconds in the XUV. And it's short wavelength. Uh, so we can make microscopes to look at fine detail. And the finest detail that you can, you can image with light is a wavelength of light. So we can see down to 10 nanometers or so. The, the XUV it only has a couple of industrial and wider applications outside the kind of fundamental science that I'll show you. And one is that the specific wavelength here at 13 and a half nanometers that they call the EU, EUV, also stands for extreme ultraviolet. Uh, it's used for lithography, so it's used for writing really, really high resolution uh, semiconductor chips. So the latest generation of processor chips have incredible amounts of, of detail crammed onto them. 
uh, there is with the EUV. And there's also an interesting region of the spectrum here between the XUV and the X-ray called the water window, uh, where, where uh, water is completely transparent to, to, to radiation in this wavelength range, but carbon strongly absorbs. And that means it's really, really good for biological imaging uh, because most biological systems have carbon containing molecules and they sit in a solution of, of, uh, of water. So those are the two regions of the extreme ultraviolet. And then we do ultrafast science. So the aim in ultrafast science is if you look at a fast process, you quite often can see what happens at the starting point and what happens at the finishing point. But there's quite a lot of unexpected things that can happen in between that affect the outcome. So it falls uh, in this obstacle course race here that give you quite an unexpected outcome. And the idea is that if you don't look in enough detail, you, you'll never see what's going on here. So what kind of things are, are we looking at? So uh, the experiments that I do in my lab are in the ultra-fast regime down here, around about 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And as a general rule, if you're looking on really, really fast timescales, you're looking at small things moving. So you can see things like human heartbeats on a second, macroscopic processes like this apple exploding after somebody shot a bullet through it, in milliseconds. Uh, processes that happen kind of in biology is these enormously tangled biological molecules uh, start to move around. These tend to happen on the uh, micro to nanosecond time scale. And then in big molecules, as they kind of vibrate around and energy gets shared between different portions of the molecules, that's picoseconds. Um, the fastest molecular vibration would be uh, molecular hydrogen, so H2. So that has a seven femtosecond kind of vibrational period. And things that are faster than that are, are just uh, electronic motion. So really, really light, uh, small electrons moving around. So uh, Processes that you can see on the femtosecond to attosecond time scale, things like if you if you ionize a molecule and electrons ejected, it leaves a hole behind, and then the hole is refilled on a time scale of 50 attoseconds or so. So ultrafast science, so how do we do it? So ultrafast science, it's a uh, something that started uh, about a hundred years ago with a, a bet made by I think Leland Stanford, who is the guy who founded Stanford University with a guy called Edward Muybridge and he wanted to know whether all four of a horse's legs ever leave the ground at the same time and he put quite a lot of money on the outcome and Edward Muybridge uh, was kind of the, the founder of ultrafast photography and he succeeded in taking this series of ultrafast images of a horse galloping and managed to settle the argument by showing there is indeed a frame where you can see that the horse's legs do all leave the ground at the same time. So this was the first, the starting point of ultrafast science. But to go to shorter timescales than this, you need a camera with a much faster shutter, or you need a strobe light so you can freeze frame uh, motion. So uh, with uh, strobe photography using flashlights, you can look at events on uh, millisecond timescales. So this is a really, really nice archive of, of um, uh, uh, freeze frame photography here. So I'm showing things like flips, uh, a bullet going through a series of balloons, and this, this one here is my favourite, the exploding milk, milk drop. So this gets you down to quite large scale uh, 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 processes uh, and on millisecond timescales. If you want to go to much faster processes, uh, then we need lasers uh, so that we can make even shorter pulses of light. And we need very, very bright, short pulses of light. Uh, which is where the work uh, that um, uh, was carried out uh, and led to the 2018 Nobel Prize took place. So these two people, uh, Donna, Str Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru, uh, jointly uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for a technique called chirp pulse amplific amplification, which really enabled people to make short bright laser pulses for the first time and has totally transformed our field. So their famous paper, the compression of amplified chirped optical pulses, was one of the very first papers that I read as a PhD student. And it was the first paper I actually managed to understand the whole way through after about five months of my PhD. Uh, it was also the first paper that I saw that had a woman's name on it, because not only were there very few women in the field at the time, but it was also quite unusual for journals to write people's full names. So, I remembered this paper quite well, and I've met Donna a couple of times, she was very, very nice. I was really, really pleased when she won the Nobel. So how powerful can we make a pulse of light? 
So this is just to show you that the, the lasers that you typically see around you, if you have a laser pointer, they're, they're essentially always on or for as long as you have your finger on the on button for the lasers that we talk about uh, produce uh, regular trains of uh, pulses of light. So uh, quite often the light pulses are produced at a kilohertz repetition rate, so a thousand pulses of light per second and to the naked eye they just look like an ordinary laser. Uh, but they do, in fact, contain these very, very short, very bright light pulses. And lasers, as you know, are uh, light amplifiers. The acronym is Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Laser Radiation. So if you pass a pulse of light, so this is the pulse of energy against time uh, at a certain power, uh, energy over time, through an uh, excited laser gain medium, the light's amplified. So you get more energy in the pulse, and more power, and more and more up until the point when you reach the damage threshold of the material and uh, your material explodes. So you either blow the mirrored coating off the surface or you can even drill a hole the whole way through. So in the lab next door to me, they have rods of glass that are about 20 centimetres long and cost tens of thousands of pounds. And you can see there is a hole all the way through the middle that's been driven, uh, drilled through by the laser beam when things went a bit wrong and um, it damaged itself. So this was like a really, really big limit for a long time on how powerful you could make a laser. So uh, Gerard's idea that Donna carried out was to change the pulse in time. So you start with a short pulse of light, typically around about 10 femtoseconds or so, and then you stretch the pulse uh, in time. So it goes from uh, a pulse of about uh, 10 microns, a real wafer thin pulse traveling around the lab to something that's probably about three centimeters long, 100 picoseconds. So it's stretched out in time and then you amplify it and then you can recompress down back to the short pulse and you've increased the peak power from this point to this point by about a factor of 10,000 or so. So it's enabled us to make enormously powerful lasers. So the key point here is to, uh, so this is chirp, we chirp, stretch the pulse and then amplify. So chirp pulse amplification is the name of the technique. And then how do you go about changing the pulse in time? So short pulses have lots of colours, so you can use uh, prisms or gratings to make kind of a rainbow in time. So this is a prism that it disperses the light into a rainbow. You will have seen this happen before. Remember the, the blue is bent more than the red, the blue bends best. And if you set up a little path like this, two prisms uh, uh, back to back, uh, you end up with a collimated beam of light afterwards, but the blue light has travelled quite a lot further than the red light to get through, so your pulse is chirped. So short pulses have lots of colours. To show you uh, why that is, or to give you an idea of why that is, uh, you remember that if you have uh, two, two uh, slightly different wavelengths and you add them together, you get eating between them as the, they go from being in phase here to out of phase to back in phase again. And when you add up the two electric fields together, you get a, a bright dark or bright dark or loud quiet, loud quiet beating. And then if you add multiple wavelengths in, uh, all with uh, slightly different uh, frequencies, uh, but all, all in phase at this point here at time zero, uh, if they're coherent and they're in phase, then they add up to a really, really short pulse. So the numbers I've used here are quite similar to what we have in our lab. I've used wavelengths from 700 to 900 nanometers, added them up and got a pulse that's around 10 femtoseconds in duration. So the wavelengths that I use here in my laser, these are on the, uh, the near infrared region of the optical spectrum. So we have a short pulse with lots of colors uh, that we've amplified. And you can get absolutely enormous peak powers here. So if you to put it in scale, the global average power consumption is about 15 terawatts, where a terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. And Bella, the Berkeley Lab Laser Accelerator, it's a, one of the biggest and best uh, chirp pulse amplification systems in the world, is a petawatt class laser system based on chirp pulse amplification. And the reason that it's a petawatt and it doesn't drain all the batteries in the world is because it has extremely short pulses. So the community is planning on building even bigger systems up to exawatts, 10 to the 18 watts in Europe and the USA soon. So to try and put the kind of numbers that we have there in context, if you're boiling a litre of water, you need about uh, 320,000 joules of energy and a typical kettle runs at a, a thousand watts, a kilowatt. So it takes just over five minutes to boil a full kettle. 
So in comparison, uh, a laser pulse from Bella is 40 joules compared to 320,000 joules, uh, and a pulse is 40 femtoseconds long. So the peak power here is 10 to the 15 watts, but for a really, really short amount of time. So the laser in my lab uh, is rather smaller than the one uh, at Bella. It's uh, a really, really good uh, commercial laser system. It's one of the, I think it's the biggest CPA system of its kind in the country. Um, uh, it fits on a, a table, but it's, it's a quite big table. It's about the size of a snooker table. So uh, it's chirp based on chirp plus amplification. So this is the stretcher here. You can see the gratings and this is the curved mirror. Uh, this is the amplifier stage here. So the gain medium for this laser is a sapphire crystal that's doped with titanium. So it's not like sparkly, glittery sapphire. It's a fairly dull looking pink crystal with flat edges. Uh, the laser works in the, in the infrared. Uh, the green light that you can see is the, the pump lasers. So we have uh, other lasers uh, that put energy into our Thai sapphire gain medium, and they have to be at a higher photon energy, so green rather than red. And the amplifier stages allow us to get up from nanojoules to about 10 millijoules in just over 20 passes. And then the pulses are recompressed in the compressor. And the compressor for us is a pair of diffraction gratings that you can see in the bright orange mounts there. So our output is finally 10 millijoules in 33 femtoseconds, and 1,000 pulses a second. So it's just 10 watts of average power, so which is just like a light bulb, but the peak power is 0.3 terawatts. So really, really powerful pulses. So uh, why did Chirp Pulse Amplification win the Nobel Prize? So it has completely transformed laser technology. It's allowed absolutely amazing systems like, like Bella to take place. But it won it primarily because of the big industrial applications. So there are two. The first one is I wanted to show you quickly is uh, laser machining. Hold on, do you? Uh, so, yeah, so that's laser machine of metal. So you can see that the lasers to do this are so powerful, they can cut through sheets of metal in, in less than a second. They're absolutely awesome. So the lasers they use are based on chirp pulse amplification uh, because you need a really, really short, intense pulse to drill a really, really a fine hole. So uh, uh, these are drilled with uh, very short laser pulses that don't melt the material. If you try and drill, drill holes with much longer pulses, uh, nanosecond pulses even, uh, it tends to melt the material and gives you really, really nasty edges. So chirp pulse amplification has really won out in laser machining. Uh, it also turns out to be really, really good for laser eye surgery, particularly the bit of surgery uh, where they're uh, peeling back the, uh, the cornea without touching it. And um, uh, yeah, the video for that makes me feel slightly queasy, so I didn't show it, but if you want to have a look, it is available on YouTube. So those two were cited in the, the Nobel Prize and the technique that I use in my lab to generate XUV pulses was also cited because it's opened up a huge area of fundamental science. And this technique is called high harmonic generation. And it's a really quite unexpected and, and beautiful technique, I think. It's yeah, quite simple to set up. So we just take the output of, of my laser uh, and actually turn the energy down a bit. So one millijoule on the 10 and then we a user lens and we focus into a little cell of, of, of that's filled with gas. We usually use argon gas and then out of the end we, we get this uh, kind of a beam of uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation that has some really odd and fantastic properties. So first of all it comes out uh, low divergence it says as a pencil beam so really really narrow beam um, but it grows to just kind of like a millimeter in diameter after it's uh, at a meter from the focus. Uh, it's spatially and temporally coherent, which means that it's, it's, it's laser-like. Uh, it's synchronized to the drive laser, so the, the red, the infrared laser that comes in and the XUV pulse that comes out are exactly synchronized to within attoseconds. Um, it comes out with this kind of temporal structure that looks like a, a load of bursts of, of radiation, and it has this uh, uh, 
uh, energy spectrum here that looks really, really good. So uh, this is a measurement on a spectrometer. So this measures the, the divergence of the XUV. So how big the XUV spot is. And this is the energy in EV. And you can see that these high harmonics, they're evenly spaced. And if you work out there, it looks like there are odd integer multiples of the laser frequency. So there's, uh, I think, the, the 19th, 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, and so on, all the way up to hundreds of orders of, of, of harmonics of the laser pulse. Um, so it's a quite remarkable thing to see, and it's still, I'm still amazed every time it works in the lab, because it's a, a process that's really, really inefficient. Only about one part in a million of the laser energy is converted into the XUV. And um, there's this kind of the temporal structure, the train of after second bursts kind of explain what happens. Because as you, as you focus the, the laser into the gas, the electric field of the laser, it ionizes uh, your molecule and the electrons torn away. And then the electric field changes sign and the electrons kind of driven back towards its parent, parent ion. And when it recollides, it, it releases the excess energy as a burst of higher frequencies. And it repeats this uh, once every half optical cycle, they're, they're tor torn away and then recollide re in bursts. And the new frequencies are generated because it's such an intense process, it kind of distorts the frequencies in the way that if you uh, turn up your stereo too loud, then the, the music gets distorted out of the amplifier and you start hearing higher frequencies. So it's, it's that kind of effect. It's quite difficult to explain properly because it requires a full quantum mechanical simulation. And, you actually start to believe in it when you see it happening in the lab over and over every single day. So this is the technique that we use in my lab when we exploit these photons. And um, yeah, there's kind of three different ways you can generate photons in the XUV. Um, so uh, synchrotrons, free electron lasers and high harmonics as we do in my lab. So if you make a little plot of the peak brightness of these sources, which is basically how many photons you can squeeze into certain time and space, uh, against their energy. Uh, so this is uh, synchrotrons. These are actually data from the American light source and American photon source. So these are light diamond. So these are enormous things, hundreds of meters in diameter. Uh, uh, these are the free electron lasers, LCLS and FLASH. FLASH is in Germany, LCLS is in uh, California. And they look like this. So they produce absolutely uh, fantastic pulses of, of lights, millijoules of X-ray energy that are completely coherent and laser-like, really, really short pulses, uh, really high photon energies, but there are only five or six in the world, and they cost something like 500 million to a billion each. And on the other hand, there's, there's my technique, high harmonic generation, which you can, you can do with a laser that you can fit in a, in a fairly small lab, and you can produce short pulses, and they're laser-like, spatially and temporally coherent, and they're really quite bright as well, much better than the light you get from a synchrotron. Um, but they are really, really low flux. So we have to think of kind of experiments that, that, uh, uh, that you can do uh, with, the, with this low number of, of photons, this really, really faint but beautiful source. So uh, what we want to do is to make uh, ultra fast movies of really, really fast processes. So there are a few ways that you can do this, but they don't get us fast enough. So this Edward Mybridge, the guy that filmed the horse running, he used uh, 12 different cameras uh, with a series of trip wires across the racetrack. And then as the horse or the horse and carriage here ran across them, they tripped all the, um, the cameras in sequence. So that, that kind of works okay for slow things. Uh, if you have a modern camera, you can take the, a high speed movies. You can do this on your iPhone or you can, as we did, you can borrow a, a really good uh, high-speed camera. So, let me get this to run. So, um, this is a camera that's running. Oh. Oh, there it is. So this is a camera that's running at about 10,000 frames per second. And we borrowed it and used it in my lab for an open day event and filmed lots of things like uh, water balloons. So here you can see us stabbing a water filled balloon with a knife. And then you can see. Uh, you can see the balloon peeling away and you can see that due to inertia, the, the water drop, the water bag just sits there for a while before it starts to fall apart. So this gets you up to tens of thousands, maybe even 100,000 frames per second for a short amount of time. 
but we want to run at 10 to the 15 frames per second instead. So we have to use quite a different technique. And um, it's a technique that you can really only uh, do with kind of physics experiments. Because it's called pump probe. So it's, uh, you use uh, one detector and you repeatedly run the same experiment. So you have to pick uh, experiments that you can start with a laser pulse. And this laser pulse pump triggers the event. And the second laser pulse that we call the probe uh, comes in at a, a certain time delay and measures what's going on. Either it takes a picture of it or typically for us it, it ionizes and then we measure the electrons that are coming off. And we repeat the experiment over and over uh, but with different times between the pump and the pulse. And then we take all these measurements and kind of sequence them up. So the time resolution is limited by the length of the laser pulses. Usually, uh, it's usually quite easy to control the time between them. And the time resolution is typically about 30 femtoseconds. That's pretty straightforward. You can get to 100 attoseconds. And uh, we generate the pair of pulses by using an interferometer. So this is an arrangement of mirrors. This is a half silvered mirror splits your light pulse into two, so half the energy goes around this way and the other half goes around this way. And if you pull the mirrors backwards and forwards, you can change the relative path lengths between the two pulses and change the time delay between the pump and probe. So this you can only do in experiments where exactly the same thing happens over and over and over. So we're looking at quite reproducible things like electrons being excited and um, uh, chemicals uh, breaking up. So uh, we work in the XV photon energy, which means we can eject photoelectrons using the photoelectric effect. So remember, uh, 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 a photon comes in, it has energy H mu, and it can eject electrons if its if its photon energy is higher than the uh, the, the work function of the material, and then you can measure the kinetic, kinetic energy of the electron coming out and work back to see which of these electronic states uh, your electron was sitting in. So we combine these two things like a photoelectric effect and the pump probe to do a technique called time resolved photo emission spectroscopy. And we apply this in my lab uh, to things in particular like two dimensional crystals like graphene. So this is a representation of our sheet of 2D material and some light has come in to excite the sample. This is the pump. And this is the short wavelength probe. Uh, these are all the electrons being ejected and then we measure their energies in the detector here and we know that energy is conserved so we have these number of electrons here uh, and you measure something that looks pretty similar when you when you measure uh, the spectrum of the the electron energies that have come out and you can work work out what the electron energy was in the material using conservation of energy. So this gives us the number of electrons at each energy level in our sample for each time delay. And then we also measure the angle that the electrons are ejected at as well. So we get time and angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy. And from this we do use conservation of momentum as well as conservation of energy. Because we know that for 2D materials the electron momentum parallel to the surface is conserved. So this tells us about the electron momentum in the crystal. So it's just the photoelectric effect conservation of energy and conservation of momentum essentially that lets us make these measurements. So we make these measurements in pump probe using really, really short pulses. So there is a trade-off between time and energy resolution because as I told you, a short pulse uh, is made up of a number of different colors. So these are different frequencies of different energies and this blurs out the images a lot. So the images that you take in time and angle result photo emission spectroscopy uh, they are really, really beautiful, I think. Uh, each one is different depending on the, the crystal that you're looking at. Each one has its own band structure, so its own kind of like fingerprint here. So synchrotrons are really good at taking high resolution static images. Five milli EV resolution is typical. You do the same experiment with an HHG source because it's a short pulse and there are a load of different colors. Uh, the energy resolution is a lot worse, 100 milli EV or so, but you can stack up this this series of snapshots at different time delays in pump probe and yeah make a make a time series um, of, of what's happening to the electrons in your material so this is a little engineering drawing of the beamline in my lab because it was a couple of years ago 
So uh, this is the high harmonic generation chamber. So it's a vacuum chamber and it holds underneath this little, uh, positioner here, uh, holds a gas cell. So the laser comes in and is focused into the gas cell and it generates harmonics. And they come out here and the next thing they see is a monochromator. And the monochromator uh, allows us to set, select a single harmonic from this spectrum. It essentially disperses the light so that different wavelengths go to different positions. And then you put a little just a slit in to select just one harmonic coming through and that ensures that it's easy to work out uh, which electrons have which kinetic energy so if you only have one one uh, one energy going in um, and then in this chamber here we have a mirror uh, that, that, uh, that focuses the xuv down onto our samples that are held in the condensed matter end station and then because we're doing pump probe the XUV is the pump and the probe is just a laser beam that goes down the outside of the table, bounces off a few mirrors, and then it also hits the sample inside. So uh, this is what the end station looks like for time and angle resolved photo emission. So this is the hemispherical energy analyzer. It looks quite a lot like the diagram I had before. So it's uh, two curved plates with a potential energy difference. And as you, as you change the voltages on them, uh, the energies of the electrons can get through a uh, change. And there's a detector here at the end, a two-dimensional detector that maps out the number of electrons with different angles and energies and a camera bolted on. Uh, this is the main chamber. So it's an ultra high vacuum chamber uh, down at a pressure of 10 to the minus 10 millibar. So atmospheric pressure is one bar. We need to be down at super, super, super good vacuums uh, to keep the surface of the crystals clean. It's really difficult to achieve these. So uh, we, we get our vacuum chamber, we attach two, three different kinds of vacuum pumps to it. Uh, we pump everything out, which takes about a day or so. And then we wrap the whole thing in tin foil and we heat it up to 120 degrees for about a week. And this is it's pretty much like baking a meringue, this. What you're aiming to do is to drive the water out of the system really, really slowly so that you get to, get to uh, uh, the lowest possible pressures, about 10 to the minus 10 millibar is enough to keep your sample clean for a day. So this thing is a lead, it's a low energy electron diffraction. Uh, so our samples are crystals. And if you look at diffraction from the crystals, you can tell uh, which way around the crystals are oriented. And this thing here on the top is a manipulator that lets us rotate the samples and position them exactly. So you get the right crystal angle and you get them pointing at the right angle in towards the detector. And this tiny chamber here is a load lock that allows us to get samples into the chamber and change them over within an hour or so. So I'm going to uh, take you through uh, two research papers uh, on electron dynamics in graphene. And I wanted to give you an idea of how big our experiments are. So they took place in my lab in Harwell, three people from my team. And the experiments were led by a team from Aarhus who had a really good idea about studying graphene. Uh, but no experience of our system. So they teamed up with some people who grew excellent quality graphene samples from Germany and some groups from Italy, uh, Switzerland and uh, Scotland who'd used our laser before. And all of these people took part in the experiment. We had about four of them at a time in the lab, plus two of my team doing the experiments. And what we managed to do was the first direct observation of how electrons move around in graphene. So graphene, as you know, has this kind of two-dimensional chicken wire structure. Uh, uh, condensed matter theorists kind of like to represent how the way that electrons are, uh, are organized in materials like graphene um, in, in this kind of uh, a diagram. So uh, it shows the, the electron energy, the kind of allowed bands uh, that, that the electrons are allowed to sit in in energy. And this axis here, uh, Kx and Ky, they're kind of inverse space. Because being theorists, they think that it's silly drawing a picture of something that's repeated. What's really interesting is how, how often it's repeated. So spatial frequencies rather than real space. So it's quite a hard space to get into. But what you need to know is that graphene has these uh, sort of six, six fold symmetry here. Uh, this is the valence band. This is the conduction band. And it touches at this point called the Dirac cone. And this is of the origin of the peculiar optical properties of graphene. And when you look at it in an Arpius measurement with a synchrotron or with HHG, you see this really characteristic strong single diagonal line that's just kind of this part here. And every material that you look at in Arpis has its own characteristic pattern. 
people walk in my lab and they look at the screen and they can tell instantly what material we're looking at. The graphene is really, really distinctive. But nobody had ever managed to uh, measure what was going on at this point before because you need to use uh, high harmonics uh, to be able to, 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 to see the electrons that are sitting at this point. Uh, because you need to you need to work with a short wavelength so that you can eject electrons from the material. And uh, these are high momentum ones. So for most people's experiments, they just splurged out and couldn't detect them. And we had high photon energies from high harmonics. So we can see this point here. So this is the first ever measurement of the electron dynamics in graphene. And this is what we like to sell as a high speed movie. Though in reality, our movies are a bit unexciting because they typically have somewhere between four and 10 frames. Um, but what you can see here, this is our measurement of the electronic structure. And this is kind of a difference measurement where we've just subtracted the first frame. So you can see uh, that these are areas with fewer electrons and these are areas with more in red when they flare off to the top here. And we've got uh, three different times, 100, 400 and 5,000 femtoseconds. And what you're seeing here is electrons being excited from the valence band to the conduction band and then decaying away in time. So this paper actually managed to tell us quite a lot about how electrons behave in graphene, because if you look at the electrons with different energies and their temperatures, you can work out how they move around and collide. So it's a really quite simple visual example of how electrons move in graphene. And it was the first time anybody ever managed uh, to measure this. So the next experiment we did with the same group after this uh, was to look at a material called bilayer graphene. So it's just uh, two layers of graphene, two layers of graphene chicken wire, uh, on top of each other. And the reason that we chose to do this is because it's a material that people think is really interesting for electronics. So it should be, according to the theorist calculations, it should have an electronic structure that looks like this with a little gap in between the valence band and the conduction band, which means that electrons can get trapped in the conduction band and the material should behave like a semiconductor. Whereas graphene, it doesn't have this, this gap, it just has this cone structure. Uh, where, where the valence and conduction bands meet at a point. So we did our time and angle resolved photo emission measurements on mono and bilayer graphene. So these are the monolayer graphene measurements, rather like the ones I showed you before, and this is bilayer graphene. And you can see already that it's a different material, so it has a different, uh, different, um, different band structure fingerprinting in ARPIS, and you can see that it does have this kind of like double layered cone structure and you can convince yourself that maybe you can see a gap between the valence band and the conduction band and you can see the electrons being promoted up to the conduction band and then decaying away in time. If you put boxes around different regions you can measure how quickly the electrons decay away and around most of this region here uh, they decay away on time scales of a couple of hundred femtoseconds. But if you're right at the bottom of the band here, then in bilayer graphene, they decay a whole lot more slowly. So time scales that decay away with electrons staying present in the sample for as long as we could measure for tens of picoseconds or so. So it's a good indication that bilayer graphene can be used as a semiconductor. So people have tried making devices out of it and trying to use it like a little semiconductor chip, but it had never worked. But our results seem to suggest that it should behave as a semiconductor and what really really matters that it is that it is an absolutely excellent quality sample so there's no you have the two layers of graphene have to sit absolutely perfectly on top of each other no twists and no wrinkles uh, and that way it could be useful for electronics but it's so enormously difficult to fabricate these perfect things uh, that it would be very very uh, expensive so we've done uh, a couple more experiments in, in graphene. So we could see that graphene could also be a laser material because we could achieve population inversion. Uh, it, would, it would laser in the terahertz region, which is out in the far infrared. We also looked at graphene as a material for solar cells, looking to see whether one instant photon from the sun could create more than one, more than one electron. And it seems it can under certain circumstances. And we're also looking at um, other artificial two-dimensional materials. We've got really interested in them after graphene. Uh, materials like titanium dioxide, which you'll we'll know from um, sunscreen, is also really useful for catalysis. So we're looking at catalysts that can be triggered by light. And materials for spintronics, which is a, a really funky potential way of making a very fast electronics. So we're setting up now to try and look at a much smaller uh, crystals of materials so we can look at samples that people have grown pretty much atom by atom and at devices 
So uh, looking at combining all these materials together in various layers and applying voltages at different points so we can start to use them as kind of electronics components and see how uh, the electrons move around and change as you actually put voltage pulses into these materials. So I've been talking for about 45 minutes now, so I think I will say thank you very much if you're still here for paying attention and uh, hand over to Henry so that he can ask uh, a few questions. So I'll stop sharing the screen for a moment. Hi, uh, thanks very much Dr Springgate. So um, I've got a couple of prepared questions and then if anyone wants to put any more uh, questions in the Q&A boxes they can and I'll read them out. Um, so first of all, uh, what's the most expensive thing you've ever broken? Oh, that was when I was working in Amsterdam. Uh, I broke one of the detectors that we use to detect the electrons. So it's a small piece of material about eight centimeters in diameter. And yeah, I accidentally put a voltage across it when it wasn't in vacuum and that cost 27,000 pounds. And Yes, my supervisor was quite cross. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then, um, what's the highest energy experiment that you've ever conducted at Artemis? Uh, at Artemis, we don't go to very high energies. The highest energy experiment I've been on, we've used a five joule laser system to make x rays. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, and then, so a slightly political question, but um, will there be any impact from the 2016 Brexit vote on your work? Well, probably, yes, because an awful lot of the experiments you do, as we saw, were international collaborations. So All right, yeah. um, I, hope not, I hope not too much. We're still planning on letting people come in. It will just make it more difficult to get funding for new collaborations. Yeah. 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 Um, so, and then we've got, we've got a question from uh, Peter Viggen. I don't know how the, to pronounce your surname, but uh, so um, what's, I think it's, uh, what's the source of energy to create the light pulses to the original laser? Source of energy to create the light pulses for the original laser? Yeah. So the, the first stage in our laser system is a, an oscillator. So that's a uh, that's a laser system like the ones that you traditionally get shown in school with a laser medium and the pair of mirrors. But to put the light into the, into the Thai sapphire crystal in that, the source of energy is actually another laser. It's a, 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 another solid state laser and that's powered by a laser diode. All right. Um, uh, just, uh, So uh, Callum Brown asks, how do you do analysis of the data to get useful information from different time delays? So, um, yeah. yeah, it is quite difficult. So we plot up uh, these band structures at different times. And then we, so you kind of, you think of the data as a, a series of snapshots at different times. And you think of it as like a three dimensional volume. So you can either slice through one particular time or one, diff one particular energy. So it is quite difficult to get good quality data out. We have to repeat the experiments over and over and over to make sure that uh, uh, we are seeing a real signal and not just noise. So we, we have a thousand pulses per second, but we typically acquire data for a, an hour to two hours in, in one single place. So yeah, it's an awful lot of averaging to make sure that we get good quality data. Yeah. Oh, this is a very interesting one. So Thomas Banks asks, um, what do you think of using lasers for nuclear fusion? Do you believe for once in human history, nuclear fusion could really be less than 30 years away? No, I think we're still estimating that it is about 30 years away. People are still trying and it's yeah. still really, really difficult. It relies on yeah, lots of big lasers compressing a pair absolutely uniformly and it's turned out to be incredibly difficult to do. Yeah. Um, uh, a uh, question from London Mertz. Um, do you think moving at uh, high speeds, uh, so the, obviously the photons you're firing, so when they, um, do, so they do they experience time dilation, uh, such as electrons, and are you able to see it with the high speed camera? I'm sure that, yeah. Ooh, funky question. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't think about time dilation at all, and the electrons that we, that we eject are working at such low speeds that, that, that we can't see that. Um, all right, and then I've got 
uh, a couple. Oh yeah, what's um, what's been your the largest or most difficult problem you've ever had to overcome when working with ultra fast laser pulse technologies? Um, they're always quite difficult to, to get right these experiments. I mean, the labs are really big. The lasers are quite complicated. If the laser goes wrong, it takes about a week of patient work to get it up and running again. And then you have to generate high harmonics and select the right one and then get the harmonics to the end of the beam line. And then the sample has to be absolutely perfect. And then you have to get the uh, pump pulse and the pro pulse to overlap each other in time. And they're both about 10 microns long and the beam path is 10 meters. So you have to measure it with a ruler and then try and find ways of getting more and more accurate and getting everything absolutely perfect all at once is incredibly difficult every time. It's like a big team of people working together. So pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, and so and then we've got a question from uh, Leo. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, so when presenting to, well, uh, year 11s or AS students, what do you think they find the most interesting about the topic? Well, but unfortunately for you, you were my guinea pigs because you were the first <laughs> I've ever presented to at year 11 and 12 question, you know, people. So if you want to tell me what was most interesting, that would be really helpful. Okay. Um, or, yeah, what do you find most interesting about the topic? Oh, I don't know. I'm excited by so, so many pieces of it. I what I like best in my lab is that the, that the work we do, that the lab that we've built has so many different applications and that we keep getting people turning up from totally different backgrounds, chemists and, and physicists, and trying to understand a bit more about what they do. Mm. Some experiments are comparatively easy to explain. The graphing one is actually the easiest experiment that we've done to, ex to explain. The others are a whole load more detailed. And um, yeah, it's just fascinating having something new to learn every time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what has your, uh, sorry, so Sophia Davis, the camera has said, uh, what has your journey in your profession been like as a woman? Oh, well, it's quite straightforward, actually. Um, there, there have always just been a few women around in the field. So when I started there, Donna Strickland was a, a professor, I think, and there were two other female professors and there weren't very many other female PhD students, but well, I always enjoyed myself and found it a really, really good working environment. And I think that's why I stayed. I mean, a lot of women don't have the same experience and they tend to leave. But those of us who stayed, stayed because we found it a really, really good environment. And it is, it's getting more and more gender balanced uh, really quite rapidly over the last few years. And yeah, uh, it's a fantastic place to work. Um, so oh, uh, what's your proudest achievement in your field? Yeah. Ooh. Back when I was a PhD student, the second paper that I was on made it into nature, and I've always been really proud of that. Um, I think we'll have a couple more. Um, so are there any uses of your work in the space physics sector? In the space physics sector? I don't know, I should try and find out. They spend a lot of time in the space physics sector looking at materials and about how they cope when they uh, go through extremes of, of temperatures as they would do in satellites or they're bombarded with high energy radiation. So I think there might be opportunities to, to yeah. look and see how these materials are, are affected by big temperature swings and being bombarded by radiation. Although we have space people on campus, we haven't found anything good yet. Um, and then I think last one before we wrap up, maybe. And this is a good general rounder. Um, so Amy Lockhart asks, do you have any advice for students who may want to go on to study a PhD in physics? Yes, just go for it. It's, I mean, it's hard doing a PhD because you have to focus on one topic for three or four years. But at the end of it, there are so many opportunities available to you. And yeah. It's fantastic. You get loads of opportunities to travel and meet people and, and say, so, yeah, just stick with it. Just ask, ask your professors about opportunities for working in research labs and try and follow them up and yeah, you'll get there. Great. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Springate, for talking to all of us today. Um, we've learned a lot about your work and thank you all for joining and listening, um, particularly those who submitted questions. I hope you found it all as interesting as I did. 
Um, so these thinking about talks happen every Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, I hope you can join us again. Um, thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.